All right, let's, let's start with prayer. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time of conversation. Help us understand more deeply the importance of moral theology. Help us to follow it more closely. We may follow you. We, just, we offer this to the hands of our mother as we say, Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. May the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. So as a reminder, it's been a couple of weeks. John Paul II is addressing some trans moral theology, especially in the Catholic Church, and we taught in seminaries in about 30 years ago now. Thirty-one years ago, uh, and among these trends are the idea, the thought that law is simply a construct. There's, there's nothing the um, permanent objective about it. Change the court, culture, place, the person. That doing the right thing depends upon you feel like depends upon what's going on around you. Depends upon what you need to get accomplished. You end up with, with all kinds of strange twisting of right and wrong. Like, things, for example, people would say things like, well, as long as overall you're heading toward God, you can sin in these ways. Well, how can you sin in and at the same time? You can't. Or they would say, well, law, law is the opposite of freedom, or law is the opposite, or they'll say things like, um, well, this culture is not European, this culture is more, this culture is African, this culture is Eastern, you know, Chinese or Japanese or Korean, and therefore the Catholic Church can't tell us on anything about moral issues because, well, it's a different culture, a different place, a different time. And so it's making morality dependent upon the culture, depending upon what's around you. Um, and so all these things John Paul II is trying to address in this simple by these principles. Trying to say that there is one real morality. Morality that is source of Christ. And in the end we're all called to follow our Lord. And this shows what's right and what's wrong. And what's right and wrong is going to be the same for everybody, regardless of your culture and of place. And are there cultures that are further off from Christ? Yes, they're all. Um, but this is change the fact that they're still wrong and you know, they're closer to this objective principle which comes from the other call to do. And therefore the church does have things, and must say things, that must guide and lead the culture in bringing the world back to our Lord. He begins then his principles by a reflection upon the gospel story of Matthew 19, the story of the rich young man. <coughs> the young man comes to Christ and asks him, what good must he do to have eternal life? So John Paul II is his own careful way parsing out basically word by word of reflections upon what these things mean and how the story progresses on how we apply it to ourselves to take this to understand what's right, what's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and we start out so far is, is that there is in the story of the scripture the fundamental principles. First of all, we have to look to Christ as the answer. Christ is the only teacher of truth, truth, and, truth and goodness because he's God himself. And it involves not only that true law, things written in our own hearts, but also the law of the scriptures. And they can be boiled down to love your neighbor and love God. These are the two tablets of the law contained in the Old Testament, Ten Commandments. And so this is then where you left off, that kind of background. <clears throat> Before we continue with number 19, are there any questions or comments that we've read that we'd like to bring forward? All right. So come follow me, Matthew chapter 19, verse 21. The way, and the same of contact, is perfection. Consists of the following of Christ, St. Father Christi. Once one has given up one's own love and very self. 
This precise conclusion of Greece's conversation with the young man can follow me. It's an invitation to marvelous grandeur ways we fully perceive our disciples after the direction, and always believe the world truth. This Latin term is a quail Christian. Means to follow in the footsteps of Christ. And it was referenced um, religious life. So this was something that was used to describe the path taken by religious people, the monks and the nuns leaving their homes and all the rest of it. And so the the second is using this to describe imitation of Christ and following. The trouble of the second is, is not saying that this only refers to, to monks and nuns. What he's saying is this is the beginning of, of, of this discipleship that everybody is meant to have religious following in the world. If Jesus himself is to take the initiative and calls people to follow him, this call addressed first to those to be trust and remission in the 12. Mm-hmm. So, yes, there's a particular calling to certain occasions. But it's also clear that every believer is called to be a follower of Christ. How can you be a disciple of a follower? Those things are the same thing. Following Christ, the essential and primordial foundation of Christian morality. Just as the people of Israel followed God in the desert to the promised land, every disciple must follow Jesus for to whom he is drawn by following himself. It's going back to the idea that the moral life, doing what's right and what's wrong, is not simply a matter of choices here and now. It's not simply a matter of figuring out the right box to check. It is a fundamental orientation toward heaven and toward God. And following what's right and what's wrong in the end means following a person. It means following Jesus Christ. So morality, the ultimate right thing to do is to obey God alone. Although every wrong thing is disobey God. And, and so we get this confused because of how these confused you know, big words confuse us, basically. You know, where you get all these fancy titles, well, this is the, the moral theology, and that's the, this foundational principle. All it means is, when you follow Jesus, or you're not. So you did. You did. <laughs> um, there's a reflection uh, by C.S. Lewis. I think it's the beginning of his um, discussion about uh, Christianity, the very Christianity it is. Um, I think it's not. But he, he says that we talk about what's right and wrong, that pe- people will push it down to, to, to one syllable words, or repeat it to yourself one syllable words. Because pe- people talk about these, these big long sentences, you know, based upon the theories of so and so, that basically you know, acts of this, you know, what they're really saying is, can Smith harm Jones and wants to. And these big complicated words. So if you can push that down to one word, so lots of words, and repeat it to yourself that way, then it's easier to figure things out. It's the view of complicated things, and we're thinking about the words, not about the act the word, the action. This is not a matter just of only disposing oneself to your teaching. Except in commandment. Not until they sit down and say, oh yes, we're wise in Jesus said. More. It involves holding fast the very person of Jesus. Partaking of his life and his destiny. Sharing his free and loving obedience to the will of all. By responding in faith and following the one who is incarnate with the the disciple of Jesus truly becomes a disciple of God. Jesus leads the light of the world, the light of life. He's the shepherd who leads the sheep and follows and feeds them. He's the way, the truth, and the life. 
as Jesus would lead us to the fathers, but much so that he see in the Son, his Father. And thus, to imitate the Son, the image of the invisible God, he needs to imitate the Father. But all all law is to help us to imitate God. Become like God. But it's not making us more like God. It's not like the Father. We're doing the wrong thing. And more than that, his point is that there's a tendency in the modern world to separate morality and religion. To think that right and wrong can be separated out from a faith. That I can be a good person without following God. These are the same thing. Now, can some people do the best they can be confused? Yes. Right? People can do the best they can make mistakes. Absolutely. But deliberately said there's a distinction and difference that makes the two so that you can truly be everything and be everything and be truly good while not following God is nonsense. Because God only God is good. Who is good with God alone? There's only one truth and one way to the truth. Only one way of salvation. And so this is this is this point where it's not simply about an abstract commandment. And, and so but there, there's a tendency in a modern world, modern culture, to separate us. And then, of course, we're going to go further and we'll separate certain laws, especially when they're lying. He's a good person, even though he doesn't fill the blank. Yeah, I know he, did, that he sleeps around, but it, it was consensual. He's a good person. Yeah, I know that he cheats on his taxes, but it's okay because he's a good person. No. There's a different person to fall into. Jesus asks us to follow him, to imitate him along the path of love. A love that gives itself completely to the brothers and a love for God. This is my command. You love one another as I love you. The word as, love one another as I love you, requires imitation of Jesus and of his love, which the washing of feet is a sign. If I then, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, you should do as I have done for you. Jesus' way of acting in his words, his deeds and his precepts, these are the moral rule of the Christian life. Indeed, all of his acts, in particular his death and the passion on the cross, and the living revelation of his love for the Father and for others. This is exactly the love which is supposed to be imitated. Of all. It's the new commandment. A new commandment I give to you. And you love one another, even as I have loved you. You also may love one another. By this, on the note, you are my disciples, if you let love one another. The word as indicates the degree of Jesus' love. And of the love which disciples are called to love one another. After saying, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I love you, Jesus continues with words to indicate exactly the gift of his life on the cross, but it's for love to the end. Greater love than this no man had, than the man who knows life for his friends. As he calls the young man to follow him along the path of perfection, Jesus asks him to be perfect in the command of love, this man is man, in part of the goal of this beginning. Imitate and kill the very love of a good teacher and love him at the very end. This is what he asks everyone with his follow. If any man would come after me, let I himself take his cross and follow me. So a lot of big words there. But very simple reason. So let, let's, let's break it down to one syllable to see if it's say. What does the Pope say? The Pope is saying that in the end, our measure of love is a person. In the end, our measure of love is the God became man. And this is how I look at myself and say, I know the right thing. But what would Jesus do? Yet yeah, kind of cutesy and silly way is blind sometimes. But if I'm loving the right way and in the, in the right context, what would Jesus do is absolutely the correct rule of our life? 
And this gives the moral code, it gives us the way to do the, the right things. And it shows us that we're called in the end to live a life of love for each other and for God. Right? Because the moral of what life we're trying to lead is simply a checkbox. I, I did into this thing, and you gave a chocolate for lemon. Therefore, I was perfectly, or I was perfect. Have you loved it yet? That's the goal. The goal is not, I did these things. The goal is, I loved fully to the end, like my genes. Number 21. Falkland Christ is not out of imitation. So it touches man the very depths of his being. Being the follower of Christ means becoming conformed to him who became a servant, even if he himself on the cross. Christ dwells by faith in part of the believer, and thus the disciples perform the Lord. This is the effect of grace in the act of Christ's Holy Spirit on us. And if you come on with Christ, the Christian comes with men of his body, which is the church. But the work of the Spirit of Baptism really read the figures the faith of the Christ, the Baptist mystery, and the death of the Raptor, those are the ones. As for joys and effects, as St. Augustine speaking to the newly baptized, we become only Christians with the Christ Christ. Why from our joys we have become Christ? Having died to sin, those who are baptized receive new life, the life for God in Christ Jesus, they are called to walk with the Spirit to manifest the Spirit's lives in your life. So in the Eucharist sacrament of come, the culmination of our simulation of Christ, the source of eternal life. The source of power of the complete gift of self is Jesus, according to the testimony of Paul. Commands to celebrate and commemorate the life of the Eucharist. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you will claim the Lord's death in the cups. <clears throat> so John Paul II here is trying to say that following Christ is deeper than simply imitating. That, that's important, that's the same. You can't, you can't ignore that and say, well, that's not important. That's not the fullness. Because in the end, what we discover is that we can't imitate our Lord fully and completely by ourselves. There, there's parts of ourselves, things that Christ does, that only God can do. How can I imitate God? By myself, I can't. It's impossible to do everything that, that, that God does. Impossible, all things are possible with God. And this is where we need grace and sacraments. Because they begin that conformity to our Lord, they unite us to God, and they give us God's own strength and power in our hearts and our lives and our souls, so we can then begin to do what God does truly. The marvelous goodness that happens through grace and the sacraments, that transforms our very beings so we can do new things. One of the great truths of the Catholic faith is the effect of sanctifying grace within us. What is sanctifying grace? I have. That is a question of It's God's life. It's God's life, but what's it do for us? Let's us know God. That's a snow God, that's for us. Where's let us go? Heaven? What's let us do? Be holy and let's us see God. See God and be pleasing to Him. Without sanctifying grace, can we go to heaven? No. 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 Can we please God? No. no. Can, can we see God and know God truly? No. Is this a big deal? Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so what these things are then is reminding us one of the great things then is that sanctifying grace, this life of is, is so true, so real. 
That with sanctifying grace, I can make a prayer like the Lord holds. I can do an act of pleasing to God. I can walk toward heaven, I can close for heaven. That sanctifying grace, the exact same action, the exact same work, does not. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, right? And if I can preach, preach all the peoples, and I convert everybody, if I don't have charity, no. I give my body to do to death without charity, I'm not. Without sanctifying grace, I go through a martyrdom, sin, not, not for the love for God, not for the truth, simply because, you know, well, I don't want to admire me, or I'm stubborn. It has nothing to do with God, so hey, God, well, it's not going to make good. If I'm a martyr for myself, it's not going to help me. It might look the exact same. But it's a very, very different reality because this transform changes the interior, changes the very essence, the very meaning, the, the very heart of what's going on. Even though the service looks so different. So, so like God doesn't hear our prayers if we're not like, like if we need to go to confession, we should go right away because he doesn't like hear us. Or, he hears us, but there's a difference between how he hears and the difference between um, without sanctifying grace. It, it's not you know, so one can still do good things, but the good you're doing is a very different sort. I always use the analogy of the child's drawing. So if your child gives you a drawing, it means a lot, even if it's a bad drawing. If some random stranger gave you a bad drawing, it's not going to mean a lot. Lack of sanctifying grace, our prayers, our good actions, don't offend God. But they're not offensive to God. They don't mean the same thing to God. Because, because we don't have his life in us. We projected that line. Um, and so, yes, it's in a moral sin. We can it's not that our prayers, our prayers are worthless in the sense that they offend God is not going to ignore them. He, he still, he, God has a change that we change. God is still going to go God came to die for those who are sinners and those who are dead. Um, but in the sense of what I can do. So normally when I pray, those prayers um, are going to help. Every good action that I do with sanctifying grace, increase the sanctifying grace, increase my holiness, makes more pleasing to God, and helps me to have to have. Even if you're in sin? With sanctifying grace. So every good I do with sanctifying grace does that. Without sanctifying grace, God wants to hear my prayer because he's good. But it's as though it was prayed by a, by a stranger, not by a son. Or no. Because there's a lot of people that pray that are in yeah, There are. I wait, sometimes I wait months before I go to confession and I just keep praying and stuff, but it yeah, and it's, the, not as efficacious. it's not as efficacious. It's, 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 not, it's not efficacious, it's not. It's still good, right? I mean, I mean the, the, the act of murdering the SOB who's who, who pets a puppy, so he goes, hey, okay, great, pet a puppy. Not a bad thing to pet a puppy. That's a mandate, that's a max word in the SOB. Right? <laughs> and so people who are in sin, those prayers are little necessary. It's headed in the right direction. And in fact, that, that can be the door that opens up their lives and their hearts to every, the real grace, there, and then come back and see them. But if they stay in that place where they, where, where they, all they're doing is praying, but not receiving the same grace, not following Christ, not the United Christ, that then those prayers are themselves really many good. But God's always merciful, God's always good, God's always calling, God's always going to give people opportunities. Um, but if people stay in that place, then no. I mean, and that's one of the reasons why we're called to 
So you can't have that profession. And I would wager to bet that most people are in that place. That's how you find rich? And maybe they're even going up and receiving. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes a lot of people do that. Full, but yeah. I think a lot of people are. And so if you, if you receive without sanctifying grace, is that community going to do you any good? No. You're going to get in trouble for it. Yeah. It is the problem. It actually causes you harm. Yeah. Um, now, is it going to mass them? Do we do you without sanctifying grace? Yes. You still, you still are called to pray and to worship God. Um, you know, the Acts of Warrior is, is still called to be polite and to help with the character of his own mother. If in addition to being an where he also is mean to his mother, he's like, you know, that's, 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 that's worse. Yeah. But the act where he was kind to his mother, at least, at least keeping that part of the commandments. <laughs> so, if I'm sanctifying great and I'm still praying, that's, not, that's, that's, that's a good thing. But I, that's not sufficient. And, and, but so I need to go to the mass even if I'm in the mortal sin. I need to pray to God in the mortal sin. I need to come back to the best I can. It would be nice if we could feel that sort of thing. Like if you could just automatically tell, geez, I need this. Great light. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. you just got this light here. Yeah. You're doing everything that you should be doing and all that. How, how do we know for sure? Well, so there is no knowledge for sure because it is a reality. But what you can know is, as best you can tell, have you delivered from your mortal sin? And that you should know because mortal sin means deliberate or purpose and fall. And as best you know, you haven't done that since you went to confession, that trust the Lord knows your heart is missing the beat of because the, the thing is, we get caught in a place where what we're trusting is my actions, my work, my rather than trusting my work. Yeah, where's the where you got in you think it? And though you're you're doing everything you should be doing, and sometimes you you know, you just always you know, questioning yourself. Am I doing the right thing? So Praying, mass, I try to be kind to people, um, help people. And this goes back to Uncle Second's point. I'm going to confession. Yeah. Yeah. This goes back to Uncle Second's point. The moral life is simply a checklist. We can't say, well, I did these three things, I'm done. Well, yeah, that's how, yeah, that's how I'm what I'm wondering. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm doing these things and doing. Trying to uh, be the best person I can. You know, sometimes you get cranky, irritable, what have you, um, judgmental, whatever. Sometimes, you know, people, you, those people are just things that we all do. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> I always remember one of those white one of my names when we sort of are quoting the uh, the, the bishop and the <laughs> <laughs> I never quite get to do it in the last story. I know I'm always tempted. <laughs> so the mortal sin has all these three parts. What makes something serious I mean, so even with human friendships, there are things that break a friendship, and there are things that don't break a friendship, right? If I say, hey, you look ugly and fat today, it's not nice. <laughs> we'll probably forgive you. I go and beat up you know, your, your husband or your kid or something, go to the hospital, that's, no, that's, that's serious. Right. That's, it's, it's not going to go, oh well, no, we just had a bad day that day. <laughs> I say, hey, fat, so you might say, oh, well, I'm not going to be wrong right now. If I say, hey, fat, so you know, you say, oh, well, I was just being wrong, but that was so surprising, but okay. If I, if I go beat somebody up, or I go to the house on fire, you know, those are serious things. It's so the kind of things that would break a friendship with a human being, that break friendship with God. So to be serious is, is what we do, but we purpose to put something ahead of God. Not just in the sense of, I just didn't put something ahead of God, but I'm thinking deliberately, this. God's a matter of what's this us. So the, the young man or one woman who says, well, I know that God says that I trust my boyfriend. I don't care because I love my boyfriend. Well, they put the head of God where you So there's a very deliberate action. Well, I'm going to follow another religion because I want to do that. So, that, so when someone deliberately puts the head of God or harms someone from God wants in a serious way, that is going to become serious. I mean, serious thing. And the harm also be for yourself, by the way, too, because you're, you're something about lost. So serious action. Done, done, we know it's serious. So if you think something isn't serious, what it really is, and you only have done had you known the consequences. So if, for example, you were told that contraception isn't a big deal, and so you contracept thinking it's, it's not nice, that's not a big deal, and had you been told the truth, you wouldn't do it. That's not a moral sin because you, you, you truly thought it wasn't a, 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 that big of a deal. It might be a venial sin, but you didn't have the knowledge, you wouldn't have done had you not. You're only doing something based upon false knowledge because of something you trust. So serious thing, but not the knowledge. Now, if you're serious and you know about it, it's an accident, it's not a moral sin. Right? If, if I'm. Uh, Shaving my roof or don't hammer on someone's head and kill them. Serious thing. I know, I know it's serious, but not a moral sin because there's no purpose. Now, if someone hammers their head and says, You're catch. But <laughs> 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 all those three things, things have to get okay, what happens. <laughs> Fifth person I killed this week. <laughs> 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 Um, oh at this way. So when it comes to living in sin or whatever or not, we're going to know we do this. It's not going to stick up on us that no out of the blue. We go, oh, oh darn it. And it's so true that even if years later, let's say that no, I used to come for a set before I knew about it, when I knew about it, I stopped. It doesn't make automatically make those, those past things more than they know so it's based on what I do at the moment, not what I know now. And so someone that wants to sin is going to know what they've done. So it's more serious for those of us who are well informed. And there's a lot of people who don't take yeah. God's law seriously enough. So none of it is serious to them, so they're not actually committing moral sins. Because they don't care. Well, caring is different than knowing. <laughs> Right? So, so, for example, if someone were to say, say, well, I know the church says it's more than something, I believe I, I don't trust it. Well, they know. Right? So, if someone says, I know the church says this is bad, I don't care, I don't think it's bad for me, they know. They have the thought that it's more than They just are just choosing to ignore them. That's different than someone who, who's taught. It is not a moral sin, but okay, that's good, I'm going to do it, it's a moral sin. 
If someone would do the same thing, whether it's one of us or not, then the heart is still not the right place. But yeah, there are people who are going to be saved to the girls. And while it's true that the more you know, the more sins you can do, that is true. We had a professor in law theology who told us, how many times do you know the sin like nobody else? Well, there's the old joke that they tell them that the can of law school or almost has been a cave or can of lawyers. <laughs> so it's, it's true. You know, one, if you, if the more you know, the more, you know, the closer you are to God, the closer you hurt someone. And that's true for the brother in relationships, too. Right? I mean, a stranger can hurt the same way a friend can. A stranger comes up to you and says, Man, you should be funny today. So I've heard the same way a friend saying that to you. A stranger who betrays you and hurts you in a serious way, but hurt less than a friend or a loved one doing that to A stranger who has an affair, you're not going to hurt the same way as, as your spouse having an affair. And so, yes, it's, it's true that the closer we are to God, the more we hurt him. But it's also true, it's true that the closer we are to God, the more we can love him. And so, the Lord, when he's close to him, in a certain sense, does make himself more vulnerable. But he does so so we can be closer to him and walk with him and be deeper in his heart. Because those who walk with the Lord and know him fully see more, understand more, receive more love, and walk more love. And that's the real, the real point. That's that's the point. Can you get you off the topic? <laughs> I don't know. This is important. I, 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 this, this, no, I think all these things are, are things that, that we should, should understand. Um, and, and so it, it is true that, that we can't no sanctifying grace the same way I can know that my hair color out. Because it's a spiritual reality. I can't, I can't see my soul. I can see the effects of it, but I can't see my soul or I can't say my grace. It's something that we all know, it's something that comes up. But I, I can have a pretty good idea of the part I'm really worried about. Right, Joan of Arc, um, one of the ways to try to trick her, they try to try, try to make her a heretic. By by they make her, they try to make her say that, that she she knew that she was saying that sanctifying grace and going to hell. And they can see all oh, see she's a heretic, she's claiming she knows these divine things, only God knows. And what she said was, I don't she said was if I am not the sanctifying grace, I pray the Lord makes me sanctifying grace. And if I am, I pray, I pray the Lord preserves me. Because in the end, what sanctifying grace does, that's the key. It's the relationship with our Lord and life in the world. And so if you're, you're sitting around worrying about losing an act of that, well, that's not going to happen. Should you be concerned about your behavior? Yes. But should you doubt God? No. And so part of the part of I think that we're called to do then is not that you stop caring about your sins or caring about your defects or caring about, but to first say, the Lord is good and I trust Him. So even even if I'm weak and I am, and even if I sin and I do, the Lord is good as always good, and so I trust Him and cling to Him and walk. Is that? Make sense? Did that's your question? Mm -hmm. yeah, these, these are all, in some ways, they're, they're, they're very, very basic, they're very simple, in some ways, they're not. We're talking about divine things. And, and, and so, as is one is a priest I knew who was fond of saying, the truths of Scripture are shallow enough for children to wait and deep enough to drive drown elephants. Anyone can get this, but man, you spend hours digging into it. And you drop all the seconds to giving us slide pages of some word. <laughs> Good. Um, 
Any other questions or comments? Okay. Article 22. With God, all things are possible. The conclusion of Jesus' conversation with the rich young man is very poignant. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrow, for he had many possessions. Some of the rich young men were disciples like themselves, taken aback by Jesus' call of discipleship. The man was just an issue and aspiration of abilities. By our son, we can't do this. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and said, Do could be saved. But the master refers them to God's power. The man is impossible. Who got all things impossible? Who can be saved without God? Nobody. <laughs> You're right, the ways without God is impossible. The good news is, God came to us. God came and walked among us, little of us, not only shows us how to be saved, not only died the cross for us, but gives us the power and the grace and the help we need to win out. And that is very good news. In the second chapter of the Gospel, by the 19th of the 10th, a Lord interpreting the Mosaic law in marriage rejects the Lord and divorce. Because it's the beginning of fundamental and more authoritative than the law of Moses. God's original plan of mankind, a plan which, which man after sin will already blew up to. Because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. Jesus said to the beginning, this made the disciples to remark, this is a case the man was wife, his wife's beginning to marry. And Jesus, referring specifically to the charismatic settlers, the kingdom of heaven, but stating as well a general rule in the case of new and surprising responsibility of the man by God's grace. He said to them, everyone can accept this saying only of those to whom it is given. When you're given grace and you receive God's life, then you can accept these things. We need God's help. And part of our spiritual journey is first recognize that you know, there's never know that we need to Right? It, it, unfortunately, be, being the way we are, we tend not to want God's help. That was Adam's problem in the garden. They don't want God's help. They, they, they wanted to be like God without God. That's why they sinned. We tend to fall in the same, the same place. We tend to say, well, well, I don't want to be a burden of God. I don't want to be a block of God. I don't want to be, I don't want to live for the light upon God. I want to be great and good. That all come to God. It doesn't work that way. Um, we need God first. It's like saying, I want to be alive with love, love, love. It doesn't work. To imitate the love of Christ, it's not, it's not possible for man by his own strength alone. He becomes capable of this love only by virtue of a gift received. As the Lord Jesus receives the love of his followers, so he in turn communicates this love to his disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, and by my will. Christ's gift is a spirit, whose first fruit is shared. God loves to pour into our hearts the Holy Spirit as we So the Gospel asks, does love bring about the kingdom of the commandments? Or does the kingdom of the commandments bring about love? And the answer is, who could not love comes first? The one who does not love the reason to keep the commandments. In other words, when you love, when you have grace, then you do the right thing. It's not you do the right thing and then you get a hold of it. I think I'm holding the Lord's help. That I can live as the Lord asks. That's why we have to be baptized first, so we have to be first, so we have to come back first. And then we do the right thing. It's not that we do the right thing, and then we come back to God. Number 23. The law of the spirit of life, the law of the spirit of life in Christ, is that to be free from loss and death. 
But these were the Apostle Paul, who I to consider the perspective of his revelation, which comes to thumb in Christ. They should be the old law and the great embrace, the new law. He recognized the pedagogic function of the law. But by able to manage to stop his own powerlessness by stripping him of the presumption of self sufficiency he is asked to receive life on the spirit. Only this new life is it possible to carry God's commandments. It is through faith in Christ that he is made righteous. Righteousness is the law of man who is able to give. So by every believer, you reveal the grand of the Lord Jesus. Once again, it's the best to do what Mary sums up this promise to the of the law of grace. The law was given the grace that we saw, and grace was given the law of the In other words, what St. Paul is saying in this part is that it's not that the, the grace and law are opposed to each other. So people often read it, and people find it plenty. Well, you're just following the way of the law. You're telling me I can't sleep around or contracept or steal or the like, you know, your favorite sentence. Well, you're just following the, the you're just a hypocrite, you're just following, you're just following the old law. We follow the law of freedom and grace, and therefore we can do A, B, and C. The pure these things. It's nonsense. What Paul is saying. As the Lord first revealed to us who He is and what it means to be a follower of God. And living that way for man and possible. He says, nobody lives up to the law by himself. The law is given first when you say, this, this is my goal. This, I see something there is a sudden sight. That's what I do. And when you have that longing and that desire, then you receive grace and life in Christ, unless you do that. Once you my, my goal is to become like God, and here I am, and if I'm really far from God, only well, am I a creature, but I'm a sinful creature, I'm a fallen creature. My goal is God. Once I recognize that, I long for that, and I'm open to that, and I can receive the life in Christ. And then I can live with that and fill that and become and then I can do it. So what Paul is saying is the old law was there to give us the goal, make us hunger for God. And once we hungered for God, then God came and gave us the life we're hungry for. So we could then reach that goal and come like a The law was given the grace that we sought, but it was given the law that we Love and life according to the gospel cannot be thought of first from as a kind of precept, but the demands beyond man's abilities. Following Christ perfectly, being holy, as we perfect everyone, the Father is perfect, not simply a checklist. Okay, we like God. God. <laughs> They're possible only as the result of the gift of God who heals, restored and transformed the human heart by his grace. The law that's given to Moses, grace and truth, come to Jesus Christ. The promise of eternal life is thus linked to the gift of grace and the gift of the spirits we received, due to the guarantee of our inheritance. God wants us to live this way, to be this, but to be perfect like you. And so the Lord is going to make sure it's possible for us, that it's not possible for us by ourselves. It's possible for us when we come to the everlasting water and drink. It's possible for us to come to the light and see. So it's possible if we first stop relying upon this and start relying upon him. And so this is why the moral law is only the fill by following Christ. Human beings themselves cannot fill the full moral law that's the most. We need God as grace to help more to do this to be we're called to be. And so we find revealing the authentic and original aspect of the commandment of love and perfection, which is order. We are speaking of a possibility of the command only exclusively by grace, but because of God by his love. 
we, we have now in a higher horizon, a deep place, we do by ourselves. Do good by yourself, but we know what that is. On the other hand, besides the awareness of having received the gift, possessing the Jesus Christ, the love of God, it already sustains the free response of a full love of God and the brothers. As the Apostle John consistently reminds us in his first letter. But love of us love of God. Love of God loves of God and knows God. Who does not love does not know love, for God is love. The love of God so loves us, God so wants to love another. The love is the first love does. Yes. <laughs> so that's ten times face. The thing about our Lord is our Lord does not come to replace us. The Lord does not come to replace our work and our hearts and our lives. With the giving of grace, He's not coming to, to push us away and say, I've got this obedience, go away, I'll take care of myself. He's coming to elevate us, to strengthen us, so we can then live as He wants us to live. But not to replace us, but to assist us. When Christ comes, He comes to make us free. So that doesn't replace our free will, doesn't replace our choices to follow God and be with God. But it gives us the ability to make free choices in the full, proper way. Not to replace, but to heal, to elevate, and to perfect. When the sun shines on a rose bush, and the rose bush produces flowers, it's not because the sun was forcing the rose bush flowers. The sun is giving the rose the, the, the ability to be more of itself, more of more, more what, what, what is its original. When we receive God's grace in God's life, it's not God forcing us against our will to be something or not. It's Lord making us more truly ourselves, so we can then put forth what's truly and most perfectly for us. And so these actions, this grace, is not to replace our free will. Let us truly give this free response of love, this free response of love possible. Not to replace, but to bring forth from us what's most fully and intimately and perfectly ours. So, yeah, the road was without the sun, so there's no road. So, we're done. If the sunlight lets the rose bush be the beautiful bush that it can be. Without God, we're, we're dead, we're nothing. But God's love comes to us not to overpower us, control us, and to shrink us little little boxes, to give us life and growth, and make us be as beautiful and as grand and magnificent as we're called. So you can then give this response to love. Hey, Thomas. It's inseparable connection between the Lord's grace and the freedom, between gifts and tasks, it's been expressed in simple words by Henry Gaston in his prayer. Dacu yubis and yubis kudis. Grant what you command and command what you will. What was that? Trying to say it. Da quod yubis et yubis kudis. The gift of grace, not less so, but reinforces the moral demands of the law. Of law. This is his commandment. We should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And love by the way, just to see his commandment. One can abide in love only keeping the commandments, Jesus says. We keep my commandments, you abide in love. I love. So I keep my commandments. My father's commandments, you abide in love. In other words, so people who would like to claim, well, I don't have commandments because I don't have God. Well, <coughs> the point of that love and that grace is to be commandments to follow the Lord. That's why we have the first ones. Going to the heart of the moral passage of Jesus, the preaching of the apostles, 
And some end up in a remarkable way in the great tradition between the fathers of the East and the West, so that's particular. And Thomas Aquinas was able to write the new laws that raise the Holy Spirit given to faith in Christ. The external precepts mentioned in the gospel are spoken of grace, and when we have the grace, which is the fact of life. If the new law is not content to say it must be done, it also gives the power to do what is true. St. John Chrysostom likewise observed that the new law is promulgated at the descent of the Holy Spirit of Heaven, the Pentecost. The apostles did not come down from the mountain carrying the Lord Moses, that was their soul in their hands. They came down carrying the Holy Spirit in their hearts, having become by His grace a living law, a living book. What's that? <laughs> I said, how nice. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a very thought. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Trying to see that. We can get to the next section. Mm -hmm. Verse 25. Though I am in the old ways to the close of the age. Jesus' converse, what was that? You know, comment, oh, or just talking to you? Okay, great. Sorry. I'm not doing Good, I'm glad to reflect on that. Sorry. You know, I didn't know if I had that question for me, sorry. You have to do one right over here. 25. Nothing against me, absolutely not. If you're hearing our Lord and pray, that's much better listening to me. <laughs> Listen to him, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Lord, 25. Jesus' conversation with a rich young man continues in a sense at a period of history, including our own. This question, teaching what those who do to have eternal life, what rise in every heart of every individual, is Christ alone most capable of giving the full and of answer. The teacher who explains our commandments and invites others to follow him and gives the grace to life is always present in all his work in our midst, to himself as a promise us. Along with you all the ways to close the age. Christ's relevance to people at all old times has shown forth in the bodies of the church. It's become quite the fashion these days to say, well, Christianity is old fashioned, they're so now you know that. There's a smart way to For this reason, the Lord promised the disciples the Holy Spirit would bring their remembrance and teach them to understand the commandments of His commandments. Know Himself to be the principal and source of the light in the world. The moral prescription which God has prepared in the old covenant, the chain of reflection in the eternal covenant, the very person of the Son of God made man, must be faithfully kept until they put into practice. The various cultures about the course of history. The task of interpreting these prescriptions was entrusted by Jesus to the apostles, their successors. The specificness of the Holy the Spirit of Truth. You hear as you hear me. By the light and strength of the, the Spirit, the apostles carried out the mission of preaching the gospel upon the way of the Lord. To you know all that follow and take cross. For to me to live is Christ. <coughs> So we're saying a couple of things here. First, what he's saying is that these questions matter to them. Everyone wants to know these things. Everyone needs to know these things. And the answer is not going to be different here if it was in Israel or in China or in on the moon. It's the same everywhere. Every person, and the answer is Jesus Christ. The answer only comes from our Lord because He alone is the way to the Lord. The answer of what how to be saved, how do I become how I'm supposed to be, how do I become that blooming rose bush, only comes about what the Lord is. And the Lord has given us a church when there are questions that arise, and that might be some. some Help to have a cry what Christ said to us today. 
So we have a church, we have our Lord, we have the truth, these things don't change. And they are needed by every person, every culture. Not just for some, not just for us, because of what the parents told us this. Everybody needs these things. We shouldn't be ashamed to say that to the Mormons, the Baptists, the Buddhists, the pagans, to the we don't need these things. So it's the same truth. Now say it nicely. I'm not saying any jokes about it. You know, Peter says at all times be right this way to give your, your reason for your hope, but do so with patience of the check. So that's not just all time to say your, your, your peace, but do so with patience and charity. Don't be jerks. In the moral catechists of the apostles, the sign of exhortations and directions connected to specific historical and cultural situations, in other words, the time the apostles and the letters were talking in a particular place and said, don't do this, do that. We also find that we're teaching precise rules of behavior for every people in our world. This is seen in the letters, which contain the interpretation out of the Holy Spirit. But the Lord's priests are to live in various circumstances. From the very beginning of the church, the apostles, by virtue of their pastoral responsibility to preach the gospel, were vigilant over the right cause of Christians. This their vigilant for the purity of the faith, and now the divine Christian sacraments. The first Christians hung both from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, different from the pagans, only their faith and liturgy, but also from the moral conduct, which is inspired by the law. The church is also, in fact, a union of both life and the faith. The rule of, of life is faith for the law. And so people will try to say, well, why is the church and a business poking their nose into this part of my life? This is my private life. Why is the church coming to do with this area, that area, but whatever it might be? Well, because to be a follower of Christ means to follow Christ. And the same way that if someone were to teach falsely, it would have to be corrected. If someone to live falsely has to be corrected as well. Because both of these things are connected, united, and at the end, mean the same thing, which is an absolute same reality. If I don't believe it, I'm not going to live it. If I don't live it, I'm not going to believe it. No damage was done in the harmony between faith and life. The unity of the church is damaged only by Christians who reject the toward the truth of faith, or those who pretend that there's three gods or I you know, the, the creed. But also by those who destroy our obligations to which they are called the gospel. If we sin, we harm the church. One reason we go to confession, which we talk about a human being, is because we have harmed the whole church by our sins. And so we confess to the church with the, the priest. And even after that, when I confession came, it was nice. But I had to go to the priest. And we have to go to Holbrook and have a little sip of confession. Because I have abandoned the church. I have to get the church. So I had to go confess the church. The apostles decisively rejected any separation between the commitment of the heart and the act to express or prove it. See 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. That time was And ever since the apostles in the long time, the church of pastors have vigorously condemned the behavior of those who false division, the teaching, or by the actions. And so it goes along and it says, there's, there's Jesus and only God, churches can step in and say, as he is. Someone says, "Force is okay, you just step in and say, no, it's not. Then the unity of the church, promoting, preserving the faith and the moral life, the task of trust is used by the apostles. A task continues the ministry of the successors. This is apparent from the tradition, where a biased divine council teaches the church and their teaching, life and our worship, perpetuates and hands on to every generation all that she is, and all that she believes. The tradition which comes from the apostles rests in the church under the assistance of the Holy Spirit. In the Holy Spirit, the church receives and hands down the scriptures that this is the great thing which God has done in history. She professes by the lips of her father's doctrine, the truth, the word, and flesh. But his precepts of love and practice in the life of her saints. And sacrifice from the Bibles. 
So the rates are called the hand delivered. The same tradition which was to receive the living voice of the gospel and the faithful expression of God's wisdom and will. It's only we have a church and a living tradition. It was not that the church today can speak differently than the church yesterday. The church tomorrow can be different. We have a tradition passed on because we inherited from the cross. And it's not passing on the voice of Christ or something, something different from the said, the said, said by the church before, lived out by the saints, died for the martyrs, celebrating the church liturgy of the past. It's different now. It's not real. It has to be we contain the tradition. So we have Christ, the church, tradition, which all be one together. Within tradition, the authentic interpretation of the Lord's law develops with the help of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit was at the origin of the revelation of these commandments and teachings, and guarantees that they are rightly preserved, faithfully found and correctly applied in the times and places. This constant putting into practice of the commandments is designed for a deeper insight and relation of understanding the life of faith in new historical and situations. Nevertheless, no one can form, confirm the determinant of the lady of the revelation and follow the line of the interpretation given to it by the great tradition of the first of the life. Witness the future of the fathers, the life of the saint, the liturgy, and the magisterium. Can differ. In particular, the council affirms the task of technically interpreting the word of God. Whether written form or written tradition, and then trust that only those in charge of the church of the magisterium. Whose authority is exercised and trusted only. The word exercised the name of Jesus Christ. The church, unlike the teaching, is thus revealed as the pillar of the truth. Literally, the truth regarding moral action, let's do or not. Indeed, the church has the right always and everywhere to proclaim moral principles, even in respect to social order. Sit down. How, how to have. So, so someone's all that's, that's politics. You can't, the church can't talk about politics. Yes, you can. The church shall play politics, but the church is called to describe politics and tell people to live good politics. That's part of the moral law. They don't talk about any human matter so far as to require human rights and salvation of souls. Precisely on the questions frequently debated in moral theology today, with regard to which tendencies and theories have been developed, the magisterial fidelity of Jesus Christ is continuing in continuity to its tradition. As for urgently the duty to offer its own sermon and teaching, or to help manage the journey for truth and for freedom. And so this is John Paul II's background beginning principles on how to live how to answer and respond to certain tendencies of the day. Well, those were kinds of them. Relativism and progressivism, and we're different now, and it's, it's only that's only your thought, your culture, this is my thought, my culture, or leftist politics, it was this pride or this whatever it might be. Now we're going to go into those and talk about those. This shows the background. But from the background, it's kind of fair what we're going to say. So, some good questions on this, comments on this? All right. Well, think about it. Put it into practice. And we'll come back again next week. We'll start from chapter 28. <laughs> Let's uh, close with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy towards us. Help us to believe and to teach, put into practice in our lives and to help your race. We may do, do your will here on earth, or rejoice thee forever in heaven. We always say and do be for your Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now and ever shall be, world of the heaven. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God.
Thanks for coming.